Hi, I'm Professor Steve Keen, and this is a reaction video to the interview I did with Lex Friedman uh, in 2022. This is an extract which is one of the most popular uh, we've put up on the web, and I want to go through and give the background to some of the claims that I made there. It's one thing to hear my words, it's another thing to see the evidence on which those words are based. Let's have a listen to Lex and myself, and I'll stop it after about a minute, and then give some background to that very first part of the interview. Let's talk about the future. What kind of mm. stuff... You, you mentioned about the importance of the biosphere, but what are the crises that are ahead of us that, uh, this, that, that a chaotic dynamics view allows us to predict well, what, and be What really about? I saw coming out of it, with, leaving aside the ecological, wasn't a crisis, it was stagnation. Because what we got out of the, the crisis was caused by a rising level of private debt. Okay? Now you reach a peak level where the willingness to take on debt collapses and so you go to a period where debt is rising all the time. So credit, which is the annual change in debt, and that's credit is part of aggregate demand and aggregate income. So credit goes from positive to negative, and that causes a slump. So, that, what, what, uh, so can you describe why that causes a slump? Okay. So when you, we, credit goes to negative. Yeah. If you ask Paul Krugman, he'll tell you credit plays no role in aggregate demand. Now I'll get into trashing Krugman in the next video, but let's go and uh, give some background to those comments I've made to Lex there. So this is my software I call Ravel, which is now commercially available. And if you want to have a copy after you see what I do with it here, you can download it from this website. But what it's doing is taking in data from the Bank of International Settlements, which is this bit over here. And that data is, that's a spreadsheet or a CSV file. We bring that in and then put it into what we call a Ravel. And that's this multi-dimensional object here. Uh, which lets me uh, say whether I want to see lending by all lenders or by, let's say, by banks, uh, whether I see percentage of GDP or domestic currency or US dollar, etc., etc. And then I allocate those to various variables here. So I've got it to a government debt as a percentage of GDP, private debt as a percentage of GDP, and so on. And then using uh, math, uh, Ravel's mathematical capabilities, I can then take in private debt and look at the change in private debt, which is what this little operator here is doing over a year. And there's, as I said in the, uh, in the interview with Lex, the annual change in, in private debt we call credit. That's the way that accountants define it, and I follow the definitions of accountants. Then divide credit by GDP, work out the percentage of it, and that's now credit as a percentage of GDP. And what I'm showing here, uh, I'm showing 11 countries out of the 40 or so that I could show from the database, just to narrow in on interesting ones. And here we have Korea with the highest level of uh, private debt uh, as a percentage of GDP of these countries, 222% of GDP as of the third quarter of last year, down to Spain at 128%. But the main thing I want to look at to explain that argument I made to Lex there about rising uh, credit giving you a boom and then credit turning negative, giving you not just a slump, a, a recession, but a serious recession, like we experienced in 2007, is shown over here. Black line here is the ratio of private debt to GDP in America from 19, early late 1940s. It starts at about 48% of GDP there, as you can see, I hope. And then it rises and rises and rises, a bit of a rise and fall here at much the same time as the Japanese crisis occurred, and then it continues to rise through the Clinton administration and, and then the beginnings of the Bush administration, and we then reach an absolute peak of debt and it falls, and the dotted line here is at the beginning of the global financial crisis, which is technically dated now from August of 2007. Now, what the argument I was making to Lex was that credit through the whole post-war period was positive. So credit was adding to aggregate demand and income all the way through from the 19, late 1940s right through to 2007 when it peaked at 15.5% of GDP and then it plunged to minus 5% of GDP and that's what caused the global financial crisis. We've since come out of it with a lower level of credit-based demand. It's currently heading down, though apparently it's turned around in most recent uh, monthly or weekly data. So that's the United States, and this, this analysis that says that ups and downs of credit are what gives us the ups and downs of the economy applies to virtually all economies on the planet. The only exceptions are ones with strange rules like the euro has about uh, where the euro's own government rules get in the way, or countries within the third world which have been screwed over by the IMF and so on. That's the United States. Let's take a look at the United Kingdom. 
Let's recalculate. And you can see a similar plunge from positive credit of about 15% of GDP down to negative about five, minus 5% five during the financial crisis. And as we know, the UK had a serious recession as well. I'll take a look at Australia, because that's one of the exceptions. Australia didn't have a crisis or didn't have a serious recession at the time of the global financial crisis. And the reason was that government policy, for which I'm partly to blame, I must say, uh, I'll tell you the story of that some other time, uh, credit peaked at over 20% of GDP, but it didn't turn negative. The main reason was the Australian government restarted the housing bubble. So credit continued being positive, contributing to aggregate demand, even though it plunged quite severely. And Australia was one of the handful of countries that didn't have a, a, a serious recession during 2007. Now let's take a look at uh, Korea and Thailand. I think Korea is alphabetical here. There's Korea. Korea is still experiencing rising private debt. But if you take a look here, it managed to avoid, it had a downturn, but it didn't have negative credit. It was one of the other countries that didn't have a recession. But during the, the Asian financial crisis, which takes it back to 1997, uh, with the Asian financial crisis, it went from 25% of GDP positive to just, just in the negative range. So that's one reason it was one of the countries to suffer from the Asian financial crisis. A better indicator though is, is Thailand. And I think you can see it straight away. There's the Asian financial crisis. There's private debt in Thailand rising from under 50% of GDP back in the late 19, or the 1970s up to 250%. And that was what gave them a huge boom. They had up to 1997 and then the crash. So credit went from over 40% of GDP positive to minus 30% negative. That's why Thailand had such a disastrous experience during the uh, Asian financial crisis. But there was a canary in the, in the uh, what they call the canary in the mine shaft we should have taken notice of, and that was Japan. And if you go back and take a look at Japan's situation, Japan again had what they call a bubble economy from the 19, beginning of the 1980s to the end of the 1980s, when private debt rose from a high level of 140% of GDP to 210% of GDP, but it turned around starting in the 19, beginning of the 1990s, and you can see what happened down here. Credit was running at 25% of GDP, it fell, it fell down to minus 10% of GDP. So these numbers scream at you that private debt and credit are significant, truly significant, for determining economic activity, and the mainstream, like Paul Krugman and and uh, Ben Bernanke and co ignore it completely because in, in their models of the economy, they leave out banks and debt and credit and money, and they think that's intelligent. I'll show you why it's dumb in the next extract of commenting on Lex Friedman.